Hey, I'm not looking back. I am not going back. The God that I serve is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that I can ask to give you things. started talking about the key ingredient of fellowship and we've been there for a while because I believe it's important that we understand what fellowship is all about. In the book of Acts, the second chapter, we've been looking in the book of Acts because we've been looking at the New Testament church and they've been our example, they've been our model. And there are key ingredients that made them to be successful and when we talk about success, you know what I mean is when God says He's pleased with us. That's good success. In the book of Acts, the second chapter, look at verse number 42. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Of course, we've talked about the early church were experiencing authentic fellowship. Fellowship forbids an unattached Christian life. And we've been sharing with you that if you are a believer, you should be attached to the body. You should be attached. And the way that I believe that God has ordained for us to be attached is called the local church. I believe that we're in something much greater than the local church, and that's the universal church. But every believer should be connected to a local church. We've, you've learned in this particular series the lesson that we taught. We taught you, first of all, that the four things that cause fellowship to work, um, first of all, is uh, to work properly is the principle, the process, the stoppage, and the product. We also saw the uh, last message that we taught. We found out, well, let me go back because we found out fellowship means something in common. It means to enjoy a shared relationship. In other words, when a person has true authentic fellowship, they will enjoy each other. And so we found out um, that what fellowship is all about and we've learned that fellowship is about one another. Of course, the first one another, we looked at several one another's. There's a, a, a man by the name of a pastor named Skip Hazek. I heard him say this several weeks ago. He said there's about 60, between 60 and 65 one another's in the New Testament. But the first one another we looked at was to love one another. And of course, the Bible says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, not because you can shout, not because you can run, not because you can move in the gifts. He said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciple because you have love one for the other. In other words, us loving each other. And then we talked about that we should um, serve one another. The Bible says, Jesus said, let the greatest, oh, oh, here we go, let the greatest among you not be served, but become servants. Let me say that again, all of you who want somebody to serve you, he said, if you're going to be great in his kingdom, all these guys and ladies got all these armor bearers and, and what they call adjutants and all these other folk around them, Jesus said, let the greatest among you not be served, but you become the servant. We saw that Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He was, I mean, if there's any great, nobody's greater than Jesus. We just sang it. Ain't nobody's greater than Jesus. And he says, in the, in the kingdom of this world, that's the way they do in the kingdom of this world, but not in my kingdom. In the kingdom of God, if you're going to operate, if I'm going to operate in the kingdom of God, we got to go by the word of God. Amen. So we're to serve one another. We also said that we ought to restore one another. There are people that are fallen. We should go and restore them. Of course, we share with you that one of the hardest people to restore are the carnal. They're the ones that know a couple of verses of scripture. I don't know if you ever tried to restore some carnal, well, they are tough. And I told you in that, in that particular series, if you try to restore a carnal one, they are liable to hurt you. They are liable to reject you. But how I many you know we got to try to restore? And then part of restoration is also there's a part where we have to stop fellowship. When we're trying to restore and they will not come under the guidance of the Word of God, we must stop fellowship. And when we're talking, and we're not talking about people of the world. We saw that scripture. He's talking about people of the household of faith. 
you got to stop, not because we want to punish them, but we want to bring them back. And one of the things, if you have true, authentic fellowship, if you cut them off, they're going to come and say, wait, I need that fellowship. And so it's not a, it's not, it was not a thing for us to, um, it's to bring a, a, a correction. How many, how many of you were spanked by your parents? Okay, some of you need to be spanked because you, you didn't get no spanking. But the Bible says that God, the, the one who God loves, he chastises, he disciplines. Some people don't believe disciplines in their church. We've got to have discipline in God's house. It's part of the house. We're going to find out that we're supposed to be conducting the house of God properly. <laughs> Some of you are going to get upset. Then we talked about we ought to encourage one another. And then we talked about, of course, there are people going through so many things in life. There are people, there are brothers and sisters sitting beside you. They look good. They look, you don't know what they're going through, though. And you don't know what they've been through. So we're to encourage one another. And then lastly, we said that we're to pray for one another. At the end of the service, we do this. At the end of every service, we ask you to ask your prayer partner, a, a person beside you, what you can pray for. We don't want you to take that lightly because people need prayer. The Bible says it this way, the effectual fervor prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Then that's our quick review. Let's go to what we need to talk about. We're bringing a conclusion to the whole matter. I know I won't finish it, so next week I finish it up. But we're talking about fellowship and the family of God. Repeat after me, say fellowship and the family of God. Go with me to the book of Genesis, the second chapter, verse number 18. Before I read, first of all, I don't know if you know this, that God is very relational. Let me say that the God that we serve is very relational. He has never known what it was like to be alone. We serve what we call a triune God. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And before he created anything, he fellowshiped with himself. So don't think, I said this earlier, don't think God needs you. God just don't need Mike Thomas. I need him. Before he ever created any of us, he was satisfied by himself. You know, I think there was a, um, a, a, a writer, I, can't, I, don't, I don't know if it's Langston Hughes, someone who said that God made man because he was, a, he, was a, he, was, he was he was lone. Uh, that's not true. He didn't make man because he was lonely. That, that's somebody wrote that. He didn't write that. God is the self-sufficient one. He didn't need you or me. And the truth of the matter, he still don't need you or, or, or myself. We need him. Listen, if I never existed, if I never served him, God still will be God. Amen. I said this about worship. You not, you know, I don't feel like opening my mouth. Don't open it then. Amen. Believe me, if you don't open it, somebody will. Amen. I mean, God ain't saying, well, would you please worship me? Would you please open your mouth? He ain't begging. That's why I tell well, don't beg nobody to stand up. Don't beg nobody to open their mouths. God ain't, God ain't in heaven. Oh, I tell you, I can't exist if they don't worship me. I mean, you know, that's nowhere close. And believe me, he just don't need us for a relationship. I need him. Amen. But he's very relational God. Matter of fact, the Bible says, if you know, I've been through this bit before, but in the book of Genesis, when God is making the earth, the Bible says, and God said, and God said, and God said. And when it gets to mankind, the wording changes. It says, and the Lord God. That word Lord means personal. He, he wants to have, oh my goodness, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great I am, the, 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 the leader of this universe want to have a relationship with Mike Thomas. Now that blows my mind. Now I, I said my name, but you put your name there. He want to have a relationship with you. You know, there's no, there's no scripture that actually say that God wants to have a relationship. But the word of God leads us to, to show us that God's desire is to have a relationship with us. And so he's a very relational God. When God made this world, he required relationships in order for this world to function properly. You know, of course, we all know this fish swims in schools. How many fishermen do we have? You understand that. When you go, anybody been out on a boat, on what do you call that? Um, sea, deep sea fishing. I mean, you've been out, okay, five of them. Okay, let me tell you. When you go out on those deep sea fishing boats, they're looking for uh, schools of fish because they know that fish runs in schools. 
You know, I, we, I love to fish. Don't get a chance to do it often. I like to go deep sea fishing. And, uh, you know, you can hear all of a sudden, you hear the, the, the captain say, okay, get ready to drop your line because we done ran into some school of fish. So fish run in school. I mean, you know, dogs run in packs. For those, Brother Smith and uh, Brother uh, uh, Percy, we were in, 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 in uh, uh, India. You know, no dogs run free, man. They don't have no leases all that. They be, they be running in packs, man. I mean, you know, horses run together. And all, we all know this, birds flock together. So it should not be a surprise to you and I that after God created this world, that everything was good with one exception. And look at verse number 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him my helper comparable to him. Notice, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper, that word uh, comparable means suitable. Uh, well, God was saying that, that, you know, if Adam is alone, he's not going to be like me because he exists in relationships. Now, I know you think you and your little dog, Buster, uh, that Buster understands everything you're talking about. I, I know Buster's part of the family. Talking about your dog, Buster. A little peewee. Whatever your dog's name or cat. Now, I, I, they, I believe they may be able to understand some of the things we're saying, but God never designed for them to replace people. Let me say that again. Oh, I tell you, I talked to little Buster. Now, the reason I said Buster because my invisible dog is named Buster. Some of you know, Michelle won't let me get a dog, so I got one. He's right beside me. Everywhere I go, my little dog is with me. He's called Buster. Listen, but Buster, whatever your pet name is, was not designed for God. Listen, Adam named all the animals. Remember that? He named all the animals, and God says out of all the animals, the monkeys, the, the, the birds, the bees, everything, he says nothing is compatible. He needs somebody suitable for him, and so he made him a woman. So God so that it was not good for a man to be alone. The church of God is, the, the church is God's community. The, the context is in which he designed fellowship to function. It was God that designed the church. For those people, and I know there's nobody in here, but those that may be uh, uh, watching this by TV or you listening to tape, I know you've seen that song, uh, as long as I cat King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. That's a song. That is not the Bible. Let me help you again. I've been lied on, cheated, talked about, mistreated, been buked, scorned, talked about, show as your boy, been up, been level almost, as long as I got, that's not true. I'm not saying you haven't been up and down, I'm just saying, to, listen, you need, you need more than Jesus. He's created something, the church was Jesus' idea. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the local church was designed by God in order for us to have closer fellowship. The local church that God's designed. Let me say, I want to make sure you hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying every church on the corner. Because there's a whole lot of churches on the corner that God never called. Let me say it again. You know, people walk around giving you their little, their little, their little, uh, their, uh, their little cards and stuff and and begging you and trying to use a gift for you to come to their church. God don't need a gift. His Holy Spirit will lead you where you're supposed to be. Amen. Amen. When somebody, you know, years ago, somebody tried to use a gift. They didn't know I called, was here to start church. And the Lord was saying to me that. And I said, no, that's not God. That's you. You're trying to start a church. But there are many buildings that have the word Ichabod written on that. And that word Ichabod means the presence of the Lord has departed. Some of them don't even have an Ichabod because the presence of God was never there. But he's designed the local church for you and I to grow and to function and to become all that he's called us to be. So when a fellowship, the church is an organism. It's designed to enhance spiritual relationship. When, when, when fellowship is occurring, the church is dynamic. The church is pulsating environment in which the people find themselves alive. A church that's been called by God, it's alive. It is, it is blooming. It is growing. It's any, listen, anything in your life not growing is dying. You know, if our church don't grow, I am concerned when nobody gets saved. And I'm concerned on a weekly basis. If nobody's saving that church on a weekly, I'm saying, whoa, whoa, what, what's wrong? 
Oh, for you said this way, a dead cat's online. You know, there's something stopping the flow. This is a house. This is a family. This people ought to be getting saved. New people ought to be born. How many, how many, how many of you know that a, a, new, a new babe in your family brings excitement? Yeah, yeah, the little babies come along, you just be goo-gooing and gaga. I mean, it's, I mean, nothing wrong with that, but I'm saying the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, people ought to be consistently coming out of darkness into this marvelous light. You know, the church is not out of line because you run. Anything, that's, anything that is dying, do not grow. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, should be there should be consistent growth. That's all we've learned. When fellowship is occurring, again, the church is dynamic. However, when, when authentic Bible or biblical fellowship is missing, the church becomes sterile, the church becomes impotent, and the church becomes an empty place. It can be filled with people, but empty, no presence of God. I cherish, that's why, that's why we have certain things in place. I cherish the presence of God. We, I get in trouble all the time, but I, I'd rather be in good standing with God, and you don't like me. You know, when we have funerals, we say, I'm sorry you can't bring secular music up here or weddings. I don't understand you guys. You want God's blessing, but you want to bring the world. Listen, either you want God or you don't. Oh, I can't get I, I stopped even going to receptions. I stopped going. Come so worldly. I ain't talking about y'all. I'm talking about years ago, I went to a reception, and they told me, we're going to honor God. I walked in there. I said, how in the world can you honor God with R. Kelly? I ain't talking about the full be the saved version. Some of y'all know, they say he got saved some years ago. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm just saying. But they had all this crazy stuff over there. He says, no, I, I can't stay in this. I'm sorry. You want God as part of your life. Listen, I want God in every part of my life. I don't want him just in the ceremony, but I also want him in the reception. Oh, I can't get no hate, but okay. Woo, I'm getting in trouble. I feel it. I ain't talking about you unless it's you. Amen. Now, first, first of all, well, let me give you a definition of family. First of all, a family is, is, is where there is more than one of you. If it's just one, that's not a family. It's got to be more than just you. That's why, again, just as long as I got King Jesus, no, it's got to be more than you. Secondly, a family is where people sincerely and genuinely enjoy being together. This is a family. I enjoy being with you guys. Y'all, you know, y'all just, some of y'all just crazy. Now, I don't, say that in a, I don't say that in a bad sense, but I say it in a good sense. Some of you are crazy. I, like, I mean, you know, I get a chance um, usually to greet uh, on Saturdays before the service and sometimes early morning service. And sometimes at the end of the service, I greet. And, man, I mean, y'all crazy. Y'all just wonderful people. You know, we, we're church. We, we know how to enjoy each other. We, we know how to keep a balance. We know how not to go too far. Okay, you know, we can tell jokes, but we don't tell the jokes. Okay. <clears throat> We don't, we don't tell ungodly jokes. Amen. A amen. We, we enjoy. So it's a family. It's a place where you enjoy. My family, we enjoy each other. We, we, we don't get a chance to get, all, get together often, but when we do, man, I have heard them stories a hundred times, but we like to tell them old stories. Remember, anybody go to a family, you, you know, heard the story. You know you've heard that story 565 times, but you want to hear it 566 times because every time you're going to laugh at the right place. We enjoy each other. Families where people sincerely and, in, and, and uh, genuinely enjoy each other. Secondly, or thirdly, a family is where people have a sense of shared beliefs. God has set this thing up so without family, without shared beliefs, without values or shared values and shared experiences, your life will be void and minus of any worthwhile accomplishment. That's the institution of family. As a matter of fact, last night I was talking to someone and uh, uh, he came up to me and he, his sisters were here from different parts. One was from uh, 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 next to Charlotte. Other one's up near uh, Baltimore. And we were talking. And he said, he had been through some things. And he said, Pastor, one of the reasons I went through is because of my, my family, uh, my, my natural family and my spiritual family. See, family has been designed, for you, designed by God for you to have shared beliefs. It is a place where you can share your accomplishments and we don't get jealous. Oh, I can't get no amens now. So without shared beliefs, shared values, shared experiences, my life would be void. That's why I love sharing with you guys when I, when I travel and come back. I like to share that stuff with you. It's just something about me sharing it with my family. 
And lastly, family is where people act and interact in ways that really work based on principles that govern their lives. See, I've taught our church non-spiritual principles, and those principles are designed not to just work in your life in the building, but these principles ought to be working in your life in your home, on your job. Okay, let's go through some of them. Look at me, don't look down, because I know some of you got in the thing. First of all, the spiritual principle agreement is God's plan to crown my life with peace. Some of you didn't know what to say. Now, I don't, expect, I don't expect visitors, but some of you have been around here for a long time. You are, matter of fact, you shouldn't just know them. You should know them. When I say no, I mean, I mean you need to know them that you apply them to your life. The spiritual principle of authority is God's plan to protect my life. The highest authority for the believer is the Word of God. The Word of God is the highest, not the Supreme Court. I honor the men and women, not our president. Or whoever is going to become president, the highest authority for the believer is the word, the Bible. For those who didn't know what the word of God meant, I got to come under the authority. My life has to be governed by the word. My decision making process has to be the word of God. God, what do you say in your word? Now I know what I feel, but how I many you know you don't go by feeling? It come and go all the time. Principle of faith is God's plan to, oh gosh, y'all just, y'all just, I have praise. Listen, John gave y'all a minus A. I'm not going to give you an A minus. I'm going to give you a D if you don't. <laughs> the spiritual principle of faith is God's plan for us to please him. There you go, A, okay. It goes back up to A. It's God's plan for us to please him. The just shall Live by faith. Faith is a wonderful journey for the believer, man. It's exciting. Scary too, but it's exciting. Spiritual principle of grace is God's plan to empower my life. There you go. Gosh, man, y'all going to get an A. Woo. It's God's plan to empower my life. Grace is not just the unmerited favor of God, but grace is the empowering presence of God enabling me to be what he's created me to be and enabling me to do what he's created me to do. Spiritual principle of organization is God's plan to simplify my life. If I'm organized, organization makes your life much more simpler. How I many you know our God is an organized God? Oh, we just want God to have his way. No, you just want to have your way. God is an organizer. The spiritual principle of obedience is God's plan to reward my life. When I walk in obedience to God, it was Samuel who told Saul, obedience is better than the sacrifice. Principle of stewardship is God's plan to fulfill my life. When I live a life as a good steward of the Most High God, I will find some of you are not fulfilled in your life because you are not practicing good stewardship. It does not just only mean money. It means every area of your life you should practice to be, you should be a good steward at home. You should be a good steward over your husband. Now all the ladies ought to say amen. You should be a good steward over your wife. Oh, Lord, that's so weak, man. You should be a good steward over your family. Oh, I wish I had good, woo. I, maybe I need to do a family series because y'all sure got quiet on that. Principle of sowing and reaping is God's plan too. For my, provide for my life. When I sow according to the plan of God, when I sow according to the will of God, God will provide for me. And lastly, the spiritual principle of unconditional love is God's plan to protect us from failure. In other words, uh, it says, he tells us in 1 uh, Corinthians 13 uh, that uh, love never fails. Now, I, we should be living in a family, we should be living by principles that govern our lives. Now, there are three relational metaphors that the Bible gives us. One, he gives us household. The second one, he gives us a metaphor of a body. And then he gives us a metaphor of a community. Now, I'm going to just deal today with uh, the family because I believe it's very important that you and I should understand that. So, uh, the first one, the church as a household. You have your Bibles. Um, turn with me to Galatians, the sixth chapter, uh, verse, number, uh, verse number 9 and 10. And of course, also uh, 1 Timothy, the third chapter, uh, verses 14 through 15. Notice Galatians 6, 9 and 10 says, And let us not grow weary. In, while doing good, or I like the King James Version, let us not grow weary in doing well, 
for in due season we shall reap if we faint not or we do not lose heart. Now here we go. Notice, he says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us good, do good to all. Stop. You should be, your life, my life should be designed to do good to all. Notice what he says, though. He says to do good to all, notice, especially those of the household of faith. If there's anyone we should be taking care of, we should be taking care of our brothers and sisters. See, some of you, 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 you better take care of Pookie Nim, who, you know. Okay, some of y'all got cousins named Pookie Nim, too. And you know Pookie is on drugs. And you got a sister or brother sitting right beside you, need some help. But you rather give that money to Pookie Nim. Now, I ain't talking about Pookie, your Pookie, unless your Pookie's doing that. But you notice, I didn't write this. This is what Paul, Paul is talking to the church. We should do, do good. Let us do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. In 1 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 14 and 15, he says, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. Stop. Paul says, I got, he's writing to Timothy, I got to instruct you how to conduct yourself in the house of God. In other words, I got to teach you how to act. Anybody, I, my parents, my parents, some of you uh, may be able to identify, some of you not. My parents would tell us when we would get ready to go to somebody's house, he's, and my mother would especially would say, now, Michael, if they ask you for, you want to eat, <laughs> you say, no, ma'am, or no, sir. And you could be hungry, at, but you better not tell me, yeah, I sure do. And, and see, my mother and my father taught us how to conduct, how to act in the house. See, some of you don't know how to act in the house. And so we got to teach you, you know, every now and then somebody, a guy show up at a service or something, have a hat on, we says, take the hat off. And some of y'all got mad. Some, some, some people, children came in with a hat on, and we got to teach your children. This is the house of worship. You, know, you remember years ago, you remember years ago, people, drunks would walk by. They would walk by church, pull the hat off. Now we got guys want to walk up in here with hats on. Well, my head is messed up. Well, you should have gotten it straightened out. We, we, man, we ain't looking at your head anyway. He says, got to teach you how to act or to conduct yourself in the house of God. Got to teach you how to act. My part, my part, I'm, I'm like a spiritual father. Got to teach you how to act in the house of God. We don't act unseemly. We, we, we don't act out of order. You know, my mother would say to me, uh, she would say to us, seven of us, seven of us, and uh, he, she would say, now, when we go to the store, do not touch anything. And what do we say? Yes, ma'am. Said it in a little meek way, too. Yes, ma'am. I never forget, we were, uh, this was like a 10 cent store somewhere, and I'm looking, and you know, you look around, see if mama, anybody looking? You don't see nobody? And I went to reach to get something, and before I knew it, she threw her shoe. That lady, I'm telling you, when I get to heaven, I'm going to find, boy, in her day, she was, she was sharp, man. I thought, whoa, what, what, mama. She says, I did not tell you don't touch nothing. Because you know what? If we touch something and it broke, they had to pay for it. Amen. Ooh, can't get no amens now. Got to teach you. Notice what Paul says. He says, uh, but I, I am delayed. But if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillow and the ground of the truth. That's why we want to teach you to worship. We don't teach you to come here and talk. We teach you to worship. There's only one to worship. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. We got to teach you how to act in church in the house of God. <clears throat> know this. Um, Joining a family, when you became part, and most of you know this, I've talked about this in fellowship, when you were saved, you were born in a family. And of course, I mean, you know, you've heard me say this many times, you could not choose the family you were born in. You were born in a family called the, a family of God, and you could not approve of who he saved. I'm glad of that, because if some of you, would approve, you would not approve of me and somebody else not being saved. Why aren't you glad God didn't listen to nobody? 
So when you become part of a local church, you are joining a family. When you become part of love and faith, this is a family. And let me tell you, we got some problems in our family. I mean, we got some problems. We got some problem children. Because you got to understand, people come from different walks of life. People come from different uh, point of views. People have been hurt. They've been misused and abused. You're going to hear this later. There, there's some people come out of dysfunctional families. And when they come into this family, they don't know how to act. Amen. You know, they, they think if something don't go their way, they take their little bat and ball and go home. Yeah. And listen, listen, you ain't the only one got a ball and a bat. Amen. Let me say that again. You're not the only one got a ball and a bat. You remember, some of y'all you know this, uh, at the country folk. Remember, when we used to go out and play ball, we didn't have a regular bat. What did we get? Stick. Sure enough, go out there and get a big stick. And somebody had a ball, we go, I mean, we play ball. Take your little ball and bat, go home. Somebody will show up with a real ball and bat. See, God just don't need Mike Thomas. He just, see, there are things in this church that don't, have, don't operate according to what I want. And I understand this. There are times when, 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 when we sit down and things just don't go the way I want them to go. But I ain't going to my, I, ain't, I, ain't, I tell you what, I ain't going to pass this church no more because they ain't doing the way I want to do it. No, I'm in a family. Oh, so, so some of you don't know that. If, if your little uh, ministry don't do it the way you want to do it, then I ain't going to work in that ministry no more. Listen, God don't just need us. Amen. It's a privilege for me to be part of his family. So if you take your little ball and bat, go home. Believe me, somebody will bring a real ball and bat now. Because that little stuff we had was just some stuff we found in the woods. <laughs> we didn't even know how to use a real ball and bat. Said, Whoa, what is this? But, but, but we have the same father. So our relationships in the church. See, our relationships in the church should transcend uh, ethnicity. It should, it should transcend creed or color. This is not a black church or a white church or Hispanic church or, 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 or Asian church. This is a spirit-filled church. And let me make sure you understand this. Everybody is welcome. I don't care what their ethnicity is. They are welcome. And they will get a big hug from me. See, see why I have to say that? Because when we first started in 1991, uh, there was a few people who did not like for us to grow. They didn't want us to grow. And, and the reason how, how I discovered it when I first started, I always taught, one of the messages I taught for probably the first five years was how to hear the voice of God. It's one of those voices, I mean, one of those messages that, um, uh, that's, that goes with me 24 hours a day because I read where Jesus said, if my, my sheep would know my voice, and by no means would they follow a strange voice. And so I was taught for about five years how to hear the voice of God. I would change up the message, but it was the same thing, hear the voice of God. And I was in prayer one night. The Spirit of God spoke to me and said, Mike, there are people in the church, only about eight of us or ten, said they, they don't want the church to grow. Because when people would come, they, they, in my face, they go, oh, it's so good to see you, brother, good to see you, sister. But when I turned my back, they would say harsh things. See, like, for instance, a young lady would come, maybe in a short dress, and all of a sudden, they try to, see, they, they try to scale the fish, clean it before they catch it. You need to bring that dress down. Say, no, who's, who's it bo why is it bothering you? Yeah. You're a lady. You, that shouldn't bother you at all. Anyway, some of you will get it. And so anyway, I called the little boy. Because, see, they used to enjoy the little intimacy we would have. We would go to Perkins Restaurant. They reminded me last night. You remember Perkins used to be on High Point Road? Now it's well, Gate City Boulevard now. They didn't change the name. And the Perkins is no longer there. But it stayed open 24 hours a day. And we would go, and all oh, six of us, eight of us, we'd sit there and just to laugh and talk and, 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 and spend a whole few hours there just having a wonderful time. And they enjoyed that. And they didn't want anybody else to come in now because, of course, if you go to a restaurant now with 3,000 people, there's no restaurant around here that can, I mean, you know. So, so the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, Mike, there are people that's with you that don't want to grow. They, they, they're selfish. They want, to, they want to keep it small. Anybody ever been in a family church? You know, family churches, some family churches like that, they don't ever grow. Somebody gets saved maybe once every 10 years, or somebody, somebody may join once every five years because the family don't want anybody else to come up in there. Well, we wanted people to come. I wanted people with their problems. Well, Pastor, they got problems. Who can better straighten out problems than Jesus? How I many you know he's, he's a problem solver? 
Oh, some of us, some of y'all were messed up. You don't have to say that. I'm looking at you. Some of y'all were messed up. Thanks be unto God. You sat under the word of God and allowed the word of God to clean you up and clean you out. Oh, yeah, we were all messed up. And so I said to them, I said, I'm sorry, guys. I am so sorry. If you need to go, you, if you want to stay the same, you want to stay your little small church, this is not the place. We want to grow. We want to see people come out of darkness into this marvelous light. And we just don't want to see them saved. We want to disciple them. And so, of course, nobody left, and we began to grow. Because we understood that we want people to come from, I don't care what your ethnicity is, don't care where you come from, don't care where you've been, if you want to walk with God, this is the right place. So we're now in the family of God, and we no longer relate to each other as Jew or Gentiles. Galatians, the third chapter, verse number 28 says, there's neither, uh, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all one. Say, we're all one. So in joining a family, he says, for this reason, in vision, the third chapter, verses 14 to 15, he says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We are in something called the family of God. Now, we are now in the family of God, and we no longer, again, relate to each other. We only relate to each other now by brothers and sisters in one family. Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 1, verses 19, rather, through 20, it says, Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. Stop. Once you come here, you're part of this family. You are no longer strangers or foreigners. One of the things that we do is that when a person becomes a member, we assign them to a deacon or a deaconess. Excuse me. We assign them to a pastor. And the reason we do that is that sometimes when people are coming in, we want to give them the assistance to, to become part of us. And so for a year, the deacon or deaconess, they call that person up to a year. And of course, after the year, you should be, you, you should be uh, part of the family by now. You know, a baby come home about three months, that baby know, that baby ruling that house. I mean, you know, that's true. Now, and I don't mean you're going to come here and rule this. That, that, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, though, that we want you to become comfortable. He says, notice, we're no longer foreigners. You're no longer foreigners and strangers. I don't care where you come from. Don't care what your, ba- your past is. There are people in here, we all have a past. Let me say that again. Some of you are sitting beside some people that had a terrible past. Oh, man, you sitting beside. Some of you sitting beside some, some drug um, dealers, some drug users, some prostitutes, male or female. I mean, you know, the scum of the earth. You're sitting beside some people that, that used to do that. But that's what the gospel will do. The gospel is the good news, and it doesn't, that's why, the, that's why there's hope in the gospel. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter. That's why I preach the gospel. That's why I know, that's why Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The good news will save somebody. Woo, some of the best saints can be. Some of the, used to be some of the nastiest people. Some of y'all used to be alcoholics. Oh, I mean, if I go to the list of stuff that we, we did, uh, probably all, every last one of them was represented either last night, early morning service, or in this service. So we got a lot of folks. But that's what the gospel would do. So notice, he says, we're no longer, notice, we are no longer strangers and foreigners, but we're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Notice, it was God that saved you. What, and God didn't have to get my permission to save you. It was God that saved me. It was God that delivered us. He didn't have to get, oh, I tell you, that's a shame. What you talking about is a shame. God could save anybody who will respond to the gospel. Woo. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So we have foreigners and strangers that have come from different walks of life. And I don't ever want anybody. And see, you know, in the New Testament church, they had people that were, I mean, came from different walks of life. There were the rich, there was the poor, there was the in-between. Of course, when we look at the book of Acts, all these people were saved on the day of Pentecost. Over 3,000 people were saved in one day. A few days later, over 5,000. In a matter of days, 8,000 people were saved. And you know they came with a lot of problems. But see, some people, and listen to me very carefully, some people think if I take the Jesus pill, that it's going to solve everything. 
you know, just not too long ago, somebody came and they want me to give them a Jesus feel. And I said, no, I can give you Jesus, but you got to work through this. Amen. And there's some things that he would deliver you all at once, but there are other things you just got to work through. <laughs> Many years ago, I used to do uh, deliverance ministries, and all of a sudden, and uh, I discovered that if a person would just get under the word of God, some of this stuff would have been worked out. They wanted, a, they wanted a, lay, a hand laid on, somebody spit on them, and all that stuff. And sometimes you can do all of that, and you still ain't delivered. Amen. But the Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth that you know will set you. Listen, a lot of people have gotten set free. I'm not, and I'm not against casting out devils. There comes a time when I have to do that. But most of the time, you don't need somebody to cast out a devil. What you need is just to sit under the truth. Amen. And not just sit under, apply it to your life. Okay, let me move on. Boy, I'm about to get in some trouble. I'm going to do a teaching this coming year about that. Because some of y'all, I, I, they used to call me a devil buster. I, I am still a demon buster. But I only bust them when I need to. Rest of the word does the work. That's why I'm so practical. That's why I'm so simple. That's why I'm not trying to confuse you. Hallelujah. So we're now in the family of God. And we know each other now by being brothers and sisters. And, and if we're going to understand fellowship, Paul says that we must identify with the family. For some of us, that's a hard thing. There's some of you, it's hard for you to, to think of us as a family because you come out of a bad situation. Let me put it this way. Some of you, now just don't say amen, enough, just look at me. Some of you have come out of a dysfunctional family. The family was dysfunctional, and because it was dysfunctional, you think every family was like that. I told you, I thought everybody was poor. I, I mean, when I, when I was in high school, when the person, yeah, I told you this a few weeks ago, when the person told me we were poor, I, I, it shocked me because I thought everybody lived like me. I thought everybody had holes in their shoes. I thought everybody put cardboard there. When I found out that my next door neighbor didn't do that. They didn't have seven children. They had three. So they go, go out and buy shoes whenever they wanted to. So I, but, but there are people who are in here that have come from a dysfunctional family. Their fathers were dysfunctional. Their mothers were dysfunctional. Some of you have come out that brothers and sisters dysfunctional. Now, I'm not saying that God can't straighten dysfunction things out, but some people come here and they come out of dysfunctional families and they expect us to be dysfunctional. Okay, let me make it more look clear, okay? There are, some, there are some young ladies in here, hopefully, it's not nobody in there here, maybe last night, early morning service, maybe in here, but there are some of them, their father molested them. I mean, you know, that is dysfunctional. Or their natural brothers and sisters molested them. That's dysfunctional. Let me say it again, that's dysfunctional. Somebody asked me this recently. Um, they said, uh, how do you deal with all them pretty women at your church? I said, well, you know, I see them as my sisters and there ain't no way on God's green earth that I'm gonna sleep with my sister okay I can't get I can't get no amens see they don't need me as a pastor to be dysfunctional can't be talking about, I told them, I, you know I said I see pretty women all over the place I mean I was in India pretty women went to Germany pretty women go to Africa pretty women, pretty women all over the place but I had to put, I had to put a, I had to put a balance in my life. I can say they pretty, but I don't mean I won't sleep with them. There's too much dysfunction in the body. There are too many pastors that are dysfunctional. I've said this often. No wife ought to be, oh no, I mean no husband ought to be scared to send his wife around pastor. No, no, no. You can't go down there and pastor by himself. Though you know, you know how pastor is. That that should never be named once among us. Ooh, can't get no amens now. Oh, neither, neither should a, a wife say, no, honey, don't, don't, don't go down there. You know Pastor's going to be down there by himself. Now, y'all laughing, but that foolishness is going on. In other words, men sleep with men. I need to get, I need to get, I need to get a little more clear. You shouldn't be, never be scared to send your children around me. Come on, oh, no, you know he's a pedophile. What in the world? Don't need no pedophile up in the pulpit. Amen. Don't need no sexual addicted man or woman in the pulpit. Amen. Need somebody who know who they are, been set free by the power of God, and will be an example. Amen. 
We need some more examples in the pulpit. So I, I told him, I said, you know, uh, the church, see, the church should be an alternative to, to a dysfunctional family experience. So no young lady should come here and, 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 ex, and think I'm going to molest her. Oh, amen. See, that's why I got some guidelines around me. That's why, um, you know, I don't, I don't go to lunch. Now, I'm not saying for a pastor to go to lunch with a young lady, whether she's married or not married, something wrong. I'm, I, I'm saying I don't do that. No, I don't do it. Well, it's all right. My husband don't care. I, I know. But I, see, somebody see me out. I'm known out here. I there ain't nowhere I can go in this area. I'm, I can't even, we can't even go to the airport. I'm not, I mean, when I say airport, I'm not just, I'm talking in Atlanta, man. I'm calling over, hey, aren't you? Aren't you? Matter of fact, I went to vote the other day, early voting, and a lady pulled up. She said, aren't you the guy on TV? I said, I am. But the point of it is, 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 is I got to be an example. You shouldn't be experiencing dysfunction among me. And, say and, and the brothers here. Don't need no playboys, Pentecostal playboys, or Pentecostal playgirls, because it ain't the only the guys who play. Oh, I know where I am. I call them wolf, wolves or wolflets, whatever you are. We, we run wolves and wolflets away. We're here to have, make sure that you have a balanced life. Now, I can't make you do anything. I am not here. But I tell you what, if I see my pal some years ago, there was a, we were having a service, and I noticed a young lady who had just gotten saved, and I saw this old guy walk up to her and start talking to her. And some of you heard the story, true story. And uh, I sent uh, one of the uh, 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 elders by. I said, go stand aside. And he kept on macking to this girl with the elder standing there, too. And he, he just, I got off. So I walked up. I said, hey. I said, hey, what you talking about? Oh, and she said, well, he was just, man, this, she just got say. She said, he was just telling me that if, if, if I needed to call him at any time at night. <laughs> now, he was trying to shut her up by there. Uh, uh, no, I, I was saying that if, if you need prayer. She said, well, you said if I need to call, anything I need. I said, well, hold. I said, hey, buddy, hey, let me talk to you. First of all, she just got saved. I bet not ever see you talking to her again. And if you come to church again, I'm going to have some brothers sitting right beside you. And I don't want you talking to none of these ladies at all, period. He hasn't been back no more, no more, no more. <laughs> See, I remember, I remember wolves and wolflets. What's the protector? Wasn't he trying to destroy her life? He didn't care nothing about her. Just trying to get another notch on his belt. We're here to protect you. And brothers, let me tell you, we're here to protect these ladies. We're not here to try to scope them out. This is the house of God. This is not the world. Oh, I can't get no amens. I, I, you know, I can't play with this stuff because there are people trying to operate in the house of God like the world. We are in the world, but we're not. Now, we need to know the significance of family. In Matthew, the 12th chapter, oh my goodness, Matthew, the 12th chapter, um, Jesus, you know, Jesus was doing a crusade, and his family shows up and tries to stop the crusade. Go with me very quickly, Matthew, the 12th chapter. <laughs> Woo, Jesus in, a, in, in the head of, I mean, his crusade is going really well, too. You know, people are just being healed and all this stuff. I mean, you know, sometimes you're doing well in Christ, and all of a sudden your family shows up. Okay, I'm sorry. Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about Pookie Nim. I'm back to Pookie. I'm talking about the Nims that, you know, I was telling a young man this just this week. Psalms 1, blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor seat in the seat of the scornful, but his delights in the all Lord. I said, you need to stop hanging around those ungodly Nims. Amen. Mama Nim, if she's ungodly. Papa Nim, if, she, if he's ungodly. Cousin Nims and Auntie Nims, all the Nims. Friend Nims, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. If they're ungodly, if they're giving you ungodly counsel, the blessed man, the fortunate man. I'm glad I didn't listen to all the Nims. But anyway, notice. What did I say, 12th chapter? Look at 12th chapter. Um, Jesus is in the midst of uh, crusade. Uh, look at verse 46. And um, notice, <laughs> I mean, everything's going well. The unclean spirits are coming out. 
and uh, I mean, you know, things are happening, and, and Jesus is teaching, and all of a sudden, look at verse number 46, it's while he was still talking to the multitude, behold, his mother and brother stood outside seeking to speak with him. Now, they want to stop him in the middle of the crusade, talk to him. Isn't that amazing? People want to talk to you while you're doing the will of God. <laughs> when one said to him, Lord, your mother, your father, I mean, I'm sorry, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. And notice what, but he answered and said to one who told him, who is my mother and who is my brother? And he stretched out his hand towards his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. You know, one time Peter said to him, Lord, we left all to follow you. And Jesus said, no man left um, houses and mother and father and, and things that in this lifetime would not receive a hundredfold and the life, eternal life to come. I'm telling you, I'm one of the benefits persons that I've experienced. My mother and father passed uh, a few years ago now, but I have some wonderful mother and fathers in Zion. I have some wonderful brothers and sisters in Zion. And so that is very true for me even to this day. But notice, Jesus states that his real mother, his real brothers and sisters, are those who are committed to doing the will of God. So this should be all the motivation we need to become Christ's disciple. So many of us, I am closer to some of the brothers in our church that, um, uh, that, that, that are not my biological. I'm closer to brothers and sisters that are, uh, are the household of faith than I am some of my natural brothers and sisters. But the third thing we need to talk about is the ministry of family. Go with me to 1 John, the third chapter. 1 John 3. Now, the family atmosphere is prominent in the New Testament. See, the need uh, believers are to meet because we are family. And being, being in a family means that physical and spiritual needs are met. When I talk about spiritual, I'm not talking about sexual. I'm talking about us helping each other. Uh, I want to make sure because, you know, we say things and people say, well, you know, pastor said. You know, we had a guy among us um, some years ago who someone had just gotten saved. And um, I don't know how people pick up on folk, but, you know, he, he decided to go over to her house. And he was saying he was just coming over for a prayer meeting. Got to watch these prayer meetings in the house. I mean, I believe, I believe you should have prayer in your house. I'm saying you better watch who you bring over. And so anyway, make a long story short. Um, he, 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 you know, he was telling that there was something about laying on the hands. And how I many you know, the Bible does talk about laying on the hands. And uh, so she's a new saint. She said, okay. And anyway, he, he, he did it inappropriately. And, of course, she came back and told me. And that's the worst thing he wanted her to do. Because immediately I sent, a, I, I sent a social pastor to him and said, you know, you are sit down. Here's, here's somebody just got saved. And you're trying to mess up her life. Listen, wait, hey, let me help you. If your life messed up, don't mess up in somebody else's life. If you want to mess up somebody else's life, go out there in the world where they are. There's a whole lot of people who don't mind you messing up their lives. But in this household of faith, we're going to protect as long as if you let us. I'm so glad she came and told me because I could handle it. I would have never known. She could have walked away to my dad. Ain't nobody like that but the whole church. But she knew something ain't right with this. I mean, he wanted to take it further. She said, no, I, I, I know, I, I've been celibate for years. I, and he said, well, the Lord, I understand you got needs. <laughs> well, by the time we finish, he understood. We ain't going to play with this. Now, we want to restore you, but you can't be up walking around and taking advantage of these, young, these people that just got saved. And you're supposed to be saved for a number of years. Now, I don't know why the Holy Spirit had me to say that, because there's some people, they try to run a con game on folk. What did I say? First John what? Three, okay. <laughs> I want to make sure. <laughs> Ooh, because I just got in trouble with somebody, but not the Lord. Look at First John 3. Look at verse number 14. He says, we know that we have passed from death to life. Uh-oh. Pastor, how do you know you, 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 you walk with God? Because I know I have passed from death to I have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. And he who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Notice here we go. 
by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren but whosoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him how does the love of God abide in him my little children let us not love in words or in tongue but in deed and in truth so as a family the new testament family they loved each other and they loved each other that they supplied their needs. So to be in a family also means that that family members must participate. Let me talk about that. We have, what we have is necessary, what we have is important, what we have is sufficient. In my natural family, we had chores and responsibilities. Let me talk to you for a few minutes and I'm through. We had chores and responsibilities. I know some of you, uh, you, you, you make your children privileged, but you're not helping your child. You know, I know precious is precious to you, but precious need to be washing some dishes. <laughs> precious ought to be 16, don't know how to wash dishes. I gotta help you. Gotta, gotta help you. Everybody in my family, seven of us, we all had chores. We all had we had to do this. My duty in our family was to dust. I started as a little boy. As a matter of fact, my fa my father started me cutting grass about five years old. Five or six years old. And back then, you know, them, them, those lawnmowers was heavy. One of the little plastic stuff out there, it was heavy, man. And so I, you, some of you heard me tell stories. Some, some years later, I was, I was complaining to my, because you, you're not going to stay in my daddy's house and not contribute. See, some of you got grown children staying up in there, ain't doing nothing. Mama still cooking for them. Mama, you need to teach them how to cook. So when you come home from work, they ought to have a dinner in there. I know I won't get two amens. Some of y'all, y'all don't know. I don't care. Teach little Billy Bob how to cook. Anyway, um, I, I, was, I was complaining to my father because I said, you know, Dad, I've been cutting all these grass because we had the Thomas Lawnmower and Company. So we were cutting all this grass, and I hadn't seen a penny of that money. And my father just, I mean, he was, he was smart. Just quickly, he looked at me. He said, um, didn't you eat breakfast this morning? <laughs> I'd have to be a rocket scientist. Didn't, didn't you? Didn't you eat dinner yesterday? I said, Daddy, that's all right. I got, I just <laughs> drop it. I don't even want to talk about it. Responsibility. In the house of God, you're to be responsible. That's why every believer ought to tithe. My, my father, here we go. Here, my father, uh, I, in the ninth grade, I started. I played football. I knew I would never go to the NFL, so I went to work. I said, hey. I, I, anyway, that's another story that I have to tell some other time. But anyway, I went to work. And my father said, now, Mike, now that you're working, you have a bill to pay. And I said, huh? He said, you got a bill to pay. And I said, well, what is the bill? And he said, you got to pay the energy bill. Now, you got to understand, um, I had never paid for an energy bill. But when it came out, my father gave me the bill. I looked at it. I said, y'all need to cut out all these lights. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know what? I went through the house. What are you doing with a light on you? Ain't nobody in the room. You know what it did? It taught me responsibility. In the house of God, we ask you to become part of a group. We ask you to become part of a ministry. And some of you, you're still sitting on your rusty, dusty. Well, Pastor, I've been hurt 30 years ago. Somewhere else, I've been hurt. And even if you got hurt, that should stop you from working in the house. We are, we are part of a family. What you have is important. What you have is necessary. What you have is sufficient. I need you. You need me. I need you to be doing what you're supposed to do. You did not stay in my daddy's house and did not contribute. You contribute work and you contribute finances. Let me say that again. You didn't come. You know, some of y'all, you know, your, your family didn't teach you good manners. I told you, Paul said, I got to teach you how to, be, how to conduct yourself in the house of God. You come in here, we got air on. In the, I mean, it's, it's supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be cold outside, but it's going, we got air going on today. I mean, when it gets cold, we got heat going on. I mean, verse 7, you come to the church that you don't, we don't try to keep it comfortable to you. I told you a few, few months ago, I just saw one bill, one, this is not all the bills, one bill, $15,000, utilities. You know why? You know why I don't have to worry because we got a group of family who understands that we contribute through giving of our tithes and offerings. I've never begged you for a penny. 
They were talking about, come on, say, let's, let's give, give another five. How many can give five more dollars? I remember, remember, I remember being in the church, they used to do that. Five more dollars. All right, five more dollars now. Come on. How many can give five more? We, we need, no, we, we're trusting God. But if you're part of this family, we expect for you to contribute through your gifts and talents. We expect for you to give. You. And, and the Thomas family, wonderful family. But my father taught me responsibility. Now that I'm in the house of God, I understand responsibility. Some of our children, some of you don't understand because when you are in your family, they didn't teach you anything. My job is to teach you as your spiritual father. I love all my spiritual children, even those that come and go. I love, I love every last one of them. But I tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak the truth in love because I'm going to tell you, and I'm through, I got to stand before God and give an account to him of what I spoke over your life. I am not trying to excite you. I'm not trying to get you all emotional because I used to do that. And all of a sudden, you go out there and live any kind of way. I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying. Because I, I, I want you, when you stand before God, I want you to hear him say, well done. Because life is not about you. Life is not about me. But life is about me bringing glory and honor to God when I'm living in his family. And my time is up. Every head bow, every eye